Good morning. I'm still learning to get through the technical difficulties. I am Reverend Arthur Lee Parks III. I welcome all of you who are online on Facebook today and other forms of watching this uh, DV or this video. Um, we meet at some in Somerset, Wisconsin, at 10:30 a.m. Sunday mornings. We have a time of fellowship, and then at 11 o'clock we start worship and the preaching sermon. Today we're going to be talking about the events that are going on in the Middle East, ushering in what early uh, rabbis called the three Gog Magog Wars of the end times. Since I've been taking on the Hebraic roots of our faith, I've found that there are things in eschatology, which is the study of the end times, that we as Western thinking theologians miss. I believe now is the time and now is the day where it says in the prophetic scripture that in the end times the hearts of the fathers are going to return to the hearts of the children and the hearts of the children are going to return to the hearts of the fathers. There's a double meaning in that as in uh, today's godly parents who are separated from their children since we're living in the last days their children are going to return to them and they to their children. The ultimate fulfillment, though, though, goes back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the founding fathers of the Hebraic faith and our faith. There are things going on in the Middle East that are bringing about the Third World War, which I call the first of the Gog Magog Wars. So before we start, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, we honor you, and we praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to preach the word in fullness to to preach the full counsel of your godly word. Heavenly Father, as I speak out today, things that are going on in the Middle East, prophetic events that are taking place, let the words that I say be glorifying to you so that those who hear them will hear the truth that is in Yeshua. Yeshua is coming soon. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, comes soon. As we move forward in prophecy and in what's going on in the world today, ushering in the return of Messiah, I pray, Father, that we will encourage each other with these words, that those who embrace his return will not be fearful of it, but to look forward to it with anticipation. We give you glory, honor, and praise, Almighty One, for giving us the opportunity to even know your Son, whom we thank you for, and he is a gift too wonderful for words. We glorify you now, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. New prophetic events are leading up to World War III. Early rabbis taught of three Gog-Magog wars of the last days. And before I get into them, on, this is October 23rd, 2011. I got a little bit of a story, which is kind of funny, and it's called, But Daddy! Uh, this is from another person. My husband and I took our two-year-old daughter to an, an home improvement store. Our daughter's name is Madison and she got tired of walking on her own so my husband let her ride on his shoulders. As we were walking along Megan kept on playing around and pulling at his hair. After a while, after, after telling her several times please stop, she kept on and he got pretty annoyed and then he scolded her, Madison will you please stop that? And she goes, but daddy I'm just trying to get my gum back. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cute myself. Um, um, we're going to start with the typical and uh, regular Declaration of Hope Fellowship. Everybody here, raise your Bibles. And, so, and repeat after me. This is Elohim's written word. This is Elohim's written word. Yeshua, Yahweh's son, Yeshua, Yahweh's son, is Elohim's living word. Is Elohim's living word. I am what he says is mine. I am what he says is mine. I messed up everybody out there in TV land. I am what he says I am. I am what he says I am. I have what he says is mine. I have, I have what he says is mine. And I can do all that he says I can do. And I can do all that he says I can do. Today I will be taught the eternal. 
the day and will be taught the eternal. Indestructible and unchangeable. Indestructible and unchangeable. Truth of the living word. Truth of the living word. I'll boldly confess. I'll boldly confess. My, mind My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. And because of Elohim's living word. And because, and because of Elohim's living, living word. I will never ever. I will, I will never, never ever. Be the same. Be the same. In Yeshua's mighty name. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. 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 Self-deprecation goes a long way in this world, and I'm probably the master at it. Um, <laughs> scripture reading today is an expanded form of Matthew 24, 32 through 34. I added some things to give, them clar give it clarity. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree, which is a type of Israel. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, Israel's restoration you know that summer, a type of Messiah's return, is near. In the same way, when you see or witness all of these prophetic events taking place, you can know that you can know his, the Messiah's return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this final generation will not pass from the scene until all these uh, prophetic events take place. Father, your word is true, and in comparison to your word, all men are liars. When we thank you for that, because we can't trust in our own selves to preach your word as pastors and ministers, and so we ask you to speak your word through us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give, us, give me clarity as I preach, and as the people who hear, give them clarity of mind, so that they can receive and understand the things that I am about to say. In Yeshua's mighty name, Amen. Elohim's, look everybody, I just washed my tongue and I can't do anything with it. You're just going to have to live with me today. <laughs> Elohim's prophetic word is being fulfilled in these last days. We see his hand orchestrating prophetic events through Israel. As I said earlier in the prayer, Maranatha, Yeshua, come Lord Jesus. The things that are happening in the world today are ushering not only the type, time of the rapture, but the return of Messiah. So instead of being afraid of them, we should be embracing them. If we're right with him and rapture ready, these events are causing us great joy and rejoicing. For those of us who aren't ready, we're fearful of it, and we need to get our hearts right with the Messiah. We are witnessing unprecedented biblical prophecies being fulfilled each and every day. This should bring us a passion to reach our neighbors, friends, loved ones, and communities. The first century apostles who were sent out in the power of the Holy Spirit reached their communities because they believed in the imminent return of Messiah. That's what fueled their burning desire to reach the people of their day. We, in these last days, are having a universal expectation of Messiah's return. We should have the same passion burning within us to get as many people saved in our families, in our neighborhoods, with our loved ones, and in our communities. If, if we are truly in love with Yeshua and expecting his return, then we should have a burning desire to reach every person for Messiah because his return is imminent. We are all witnessing how today's headlines and Arab leaders are quoting Psalm 83 verbatim. The nations prophesied in Psalm 83 are represented by the Arab League of States that surround Israel. Some say the Almighty's prophetic word is murky and can't be definitely understood. That's not completely correct. That was only true before Israel was established and birthed as a nation in 1948. In a sense, though, they are right as well, because some prophecy is mostly understood during and after its events present themselves. We who recognize the times, though, are considered wise by heaven's standards. Wisdom makes us passionate to get the prophetic word out for all to understand and apply before it's too late, such as Daniel. The, he told us in his book, Chapter 12, that heaven looks at those who see the end times and perceive them shine brightly as the stars of heaven. We are considered wise in Elohim's eyes. 
There are three prophetic events in the near future that we must be aware of and be prepared for. If we're going to be evacuated from this dimension in the primary rapture of Messiah's faithful. Number one. The rapture of the church is the next prophetic event to be fulfilled at a future festival of trumpets, which will more than likely be this year, but it could be another year. I'm not going to tell you that it's a certain year. We are convinced of the, uh, of the festival of the season that Yeshua told us to look at. Number two, the first of the three Gog Magog Wars, which I call World War III, will probably occur to, uh, prior to the peace treaty that uh, the false messiah introduces, uh, and this war will probably be the catalyst for that um, treaty. Number three, the oracle of Damascus will be drawn up probably at or before the rapture prior to the false messiah's revealing. And he can't be revealed before we're evacuated and Jacob's trouble begins. The Oracle of Damascus is what tells us that Damascus is going to be completely destroyed, leading into the Gog-Magog War. Whenever there is a move of Yahweh's mighty Holy Spirit, Satan tries to distract it with his own works, such as changing focus, uh, uh, such a changing focus was that Hebrew was restored during the Bolshevik Revolution. Instead of watching the t uh, Zephaniah being um, fulfilled, the prophecy of the Hebrew being restored, it was distracted from by the Bolshevik uh, Revolution of 1917. Hebrew hadn't been a common language in Israel for nearly 2,700 years. Aramaic became the street language going back to their captivity in Babylon between 722 and 586 BC. Hebrew was technically a dead language for around uh, 2,700 years as a street language. Hebrew was only spoken by the high priests who had conducted their uh, religious duties in the temple after 516 BC. Before Yeshua's birth, first century Jews in Israel either spoke in what's called Koine Greek or Community Greek, it was, or it was um, um, Aramaic, or for political and commercial purposes, uh, Rome, from Rome, Latin. For Israel to be united against overwhelming hordes of the Gog Magog wars to come, Israel had to first have a united language, which, as I said, was re started to be restored in 1917. Over 2,500 years ago, the prophet Zephaniah prophesied that ancient Hebrew would be restored and spoken as the common language in a restored Israel during the end times of the last days. Here is that prophecy. Zephaniah 3.9 says, I will restore to the nation the pure language of Hebrew, that all of them who are my people may call on the name of Yahweh to serve him shoulder to shoulder. In the Hebrew, it really means with one unanimous consent and in, with one united shoulder. And we need to understand that. A country cannot have a unity of purpose without a unity of language. And I believe that's also true for the United States for speaking English. It's interesting to note the year the Hebrew language was being restored prophetically through Eliezer ben Yehuda that the Bolshevik Revolution took place to introduce communism in 1917, as the Hebrew was being restored to the Jewish people who followed after Elohim, communism was taking uh, root in uh, the Eastern Bloc nations. In 1917, Eliezer ben Yehuda, a Jewish linguistic scholar who lived in Israel, received a vision from the Holy Spirit to restore the pure language of the prophets from the Almighty and fulfill Zephaniah's prophecy. He was taught directly by the Holy Spirit, so he got the language right. Eliezer ben Yehuda began to revive ancient Hebrew in its purity with its original 7,000 words related to temple worship, as it was used by the ancient Levitical priests, and it was finally published in 1922. 
If Satan can't distract believers from the prophetic word being fulfilled, or recognized by us when it is being fulfilled, he tries to disrupt it. When Israel was getting ready to move, or the people of Israel was beginning to move to Palestine, which was actually Israel, um, Hitler entered with his Third Reich to try to destroy the people of Israel all across the world to keep them from entering into Israel and restoring her as a nation. That was to stop prophecy from being fulfilled and the end times and his demise soon. Satan tried to destroy the Jews worldwide through his more than willing pawn on Yahweh's chessboard of prophetic events as he rose to power after World War I between the years of 1933 and 1945. The first Gog-Magog War, which will be called World War III, is already in play. It begins when the international community tries to divide Israel, and that proposal went through the United Nations in September. This was prophesied in Joel 3.2, and we are watching it uh, being fulfilled. Which leads me to point one. The restoration of Israel was the primary prophetic event that ushers in a series of future three Gog Magog wars during what we call the time of Messiah, which began in 1967. Hebrew historians, rabbis, and theologians teach the descendants of Amalek will play a decisive role in deceiving um, world activities into attacking Israel. I will tell you more about the, uh, the, um, the um, Amaleki, it's a hard word to say, uh, in a little bit. Jewish rabbis taught and prophesied the Amalekai would be empowered by Elohim to spread their subversive influence secretly throughout the nations and governments of the world, involving them in a series of three world wars known as the Wars of Gog and Magog. The unsuspecting Gentile nations would fall prey to the growing confusion and allow themselves to be mobilized against the Jewish people. In the third and final of those wars, Amalek would lead those forces to invade Israeli soil and lay siege to Jerusalem. The, tra the traditions also offer to numerous spies in Jewish ranks attempting to betray Israel to the enemy. Unable to take the city, the forces under the Amalekite control would suddenly panic, slaying each other in the process, for evil always self-destructs in the end. At that moment, Messiah would be revealed. In a couple years ago, when that, uh, when that flotilla was stopped by the Israelis uh, from entering the Gaza Strip, the rabbis and priests of those days said that this was the beginning of the Gog-Magog War. We are seeing it unfold even as these days progress. Many Muslims are descendants of Amalek or follow the teachings of Amalek, the most prominent being Muhammad himself. Islam's major sects, Sunni and Shia, follow the teachings of Amalek. Amalekites are Iraqi descendants of Haman who tried to destroy the Jews during the life of Queen Esther. They are called the Sudi, meaning the plunderers in Iraqi history books. Some, some of these Sudi have emigrated to Egypt, but others emigrated to the land of the Magog, which we believe is historical Russia. Amalekites have one goal and one goal alone to completely destroy Israel and all the Jews worldwide forever and ever. As stated, the first Gog Magog War, World War III, involves the Arab League of States along with present day Russia and China. This is the Gog Magog War, Ezekiel 38 1 through 39 16 prophesies. The second Gog Magog War of the last days will be waged by the false Messiah, the false prophet, and Satan at Armageddon, ushering Messiah's glorious return and judgment of the nations. That takes place in Revelation 19. Satan will be secretly active in the first Gog-Magog war, but openly active in the second and third. The third Gog-Magog war of the last days in Revelation 20 
prophesies in Ezekiel 39, is prophesied in Ezekiel 39, 17 through 20, and that will be the last Gog Magog war. After Messiah's millennial reign, Satan will have one last chance to wage war on heaven. Satan has waged war on heaven, Jews, and Christians for millennia. His continued efforts have proved to be futile, and his continued efforts are madness. Albert Einstein once said, Madness is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. Satan will wage three futile Gog Magog wars on Messiah and his people, and he will always face ultimate defeat. Israel was restored in 1948 and is restored as a sovereign nation, fulfilling prophecy that she would be restored. That was in Ezekiel 36 and 37, along with passages in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many of the uh, small or uh, minor prophets. This is the, this is the final generation in human history. This is the time Messiah, and the time that Messiah began his rule began when Israel restored Jerusalem as her capital in 1967. We know for certain that this is the time of Messiah and that this is the final generation because Yeshua promised to us that his return will follow the prophetic fulfillment of Israel's re restoration in Ezekiel 37. Elohim's prophetic program can be subdivided into three distinct plans. A plan for Israel, a plan for the church, and a plan for unsaved humanity. And all of these center around the Messiah's eternal rule. How Elohim deals with the future Gentile nations and Messiah's future kingdom will be directly based on their actions and relationship with Israel in the past. So we as American citizens of the United States must continue to support Israel. She, without Israel, there would be no United States, and without the United States, there would be no Israel. So how we treat her now will determine our judgment then. Since the restoration of Israel, she's never been at true rest. She's firmly established, but she's never been at peace. And, and you need to keep in mind, even though they're trying to divide Israel and Jerusalem, Jerusalem will never be fully divided, and the Jews will not give her up. Nor will they split the sovereign state of Israel under any circumstance. There's judgment for that. Joel 3, 1 and 2 says, At the time of those events where they call for the division of Israel, says Yahweh, when I restore the prosperity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather the armies of the world into the valley of Jehoshaphat, or the valley of judgment. There I will judge them for harming my people, my special possession, for scattering my people among the nations, and for dividing up my land. Another name for that valley is called the valley of decisive action. When they move against Israel, all the... Uh, military that goes against her is going to see some very severe judgment. <clears throat> Both the Israelis and the Palestinians claim Jerusalem as their holy city, yet only Israel has the backing of Elohim's prophetic word. Israel has the land grant given to them directly from Elohim to their forefather Abraham. That wasn't given to Ishmael or the Arabs, it was given to the Jews. And we have to remember that. It wasn't given to any other country or people but the Jewish people of Israel. Elohim's prophetic word says Jerusalem belongs to Israel alone. There is also a continuing struggle over Jerusalem. We're watching it daily. We've seen it in the United Nations proposals and uh, worldwide trying to... Uh, put Israel in a place where they can be wiped off the map and their uh, name erased from the history books. We will not let that happen. We cannot let that happen. The Palestinians want Jerusalem as their capital city as they push for a Palestinian state. 
And the Arab League will gl uh, gladly, willingly, and violently make that happen if it's all possible with them. They don't understand the Holy One who protects Israel. And they will find out very quickly when they move against her. Elohim will deal as harshly with all Gentile nations in direct proportion to how they treat Israel. This, this is a principle of reciprocation, and it is found in the covenant that he established with Abraham. Genesis 12.3 tells us, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now, we, we hear that Iran is capable or uh, building nuclear weapons. They're not ready yet. That's a lie. They do have nuclear weapons. They can be attached to the S-300 and S-500 rockets, uh, inter, the uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles that they have in their stockpiles. They can be sent at different places worldwide. They do exist, and they do have them. Make no mistake, Iran has nuclear capabilities. Iran has n nuclear bombs capable of traveling intercontinentally and we have to be ready for it, and we have to be ready to stop them in their tracks. Iran has nuclear aspirations that present one of the greatest threats Israel and the United States face, and Iran is playing out Elohim's prophetic word moving toward the Gog-Magog wars. They are actually challenging Israel to stop their flotillas from entering the Gaza Strip. And if Israel responds, that will start the Gog-Magog war. Uh, which we call World War III. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 declares, I will make Jerusalem an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. All the nations that gather against it to try to move it, but they will also be hurt, uh, hurting themselves in the process. Keep in mind, you move against Israel, you move against the Almighty. If you move, try to move against the Almighty, he's going to send his mighty warrior angels, and he, they're going to do business. And Israel will stand firm and be protected by his mighty hand, and all the nations that go against her are going to be really sorry they did. That goes to point two. The restoration of Jerusalem to Israel during the Six-Day War of 1967 ushered in the time of Messiah. I told you about that. Now the Jews, along with believers, are looking for him to come. We are looking at his return. They are looking at for the Messiah who is yet to come. They're both the same person. Elohim's word prophesied the proliferation or spread of nuclear weapons among Israel's enemies will be a major concern for her worldwide in the last days. Elohim's word prophesies nuclear warfare during the tribulation period in the books of Ezekiel and Revelation. Nuclear proliferation among the Gentiles proves we're close to Messiah's return. The situation that exists in the Middle East today is one of the last signs prophesied that proves that we are living in those last days in the final generation before the rapture of the saints and of Messiah's return. The current crisis in Israel is boiling over because of anti-Semitism worldwide and including her uh, surrounding countries. These countries that surround Israel uh, want Israel and the Jews wiped off the face of the earth. That's why they're trying to split her west from the east to g give her no... Um, um, middle-aged um, thought loss. She won't be able to protect herself if she loses the western lands or uh, when they're split from east to west. We can't let that happen because she needs a defensible border. Many of our politicians and so-called peacemakers wrongly believe that if they can create a separate Palestinian state, the Middle East will see peace. It won't and the prophetic word won't allow it. Asaph, the high priest and prophet, was inspired by the Holy Spirit in Psalm 83 to warn that Israel would be surrounded by her enemies after Israel was restored in the last days. Psalm 83 was written around the 10th, the 10th century A.D. 
But Elohim's word gives no detail of any coordinated attempt by any of Israel's neighbors to destroy her during this time with that particular coalition. This, this psalm prophesied that the Arab League would uh, try to destroy Israel and remove her memory from the annals of history. Its name, it names every member of the Arab League by their ancient names. Remember, Ahmadinejad, that despot from Iran, is quoting uh, Psalm 83 verbatim. Here's what Psalm 83, 1 through 8 says. O Elohim, do not be silent. Do not be deaf. Do not be quiet, O Elohim. Don't you hear the uproar of your enemies? Don't you see what your arrogant enemies are rising up? They devise crafty schemes against your people. They conspire against your precious one. Come, they say, and this is uh, where Ahmadinejad is quoting Psalm 83. Let us wipe out Israel as a nation. We will destroy the very memory of its existence. Yes, this was their unanimous decision. That's exactly what um, Ahmadinejad is saying. Psalm 83, Joel 3.2, and Ezekiel 38.1 through 39.16 are now at play. We as believers can sit back and watch it happen and trust that Elohim has everything under control because he's sovereign. And we don't have to worry about what's happening over there because he's going to take care of business. And we get to enjoy watching it because we know what's going to happen. Because those of us who are embracing the end times are wise in his eyes and he's allowing us to see it as it takes place. Going on. They signed a mutual defense treaty as allies against you. This took place in 1949 or 47, one of the two, I can't remember. Those, these Edomites of southern Jordan and Ishmaelites of Saudi Arabia, Moabites, which are Palestinians in, in central Jordan, and Hagrites of Egypt, Gebelites of Hezbollah in northern Lebanon, Ammonites, the Palestinians in, in northern Jordan, and Amalekites, Arabs of the Sinai area, and the people of Philistia, which are the Hamas of the Gaza Strip, and Tyre, which are other uh, Hezbollah uh, people, and southern Lebanon along the Mediterranean. Assyria, which is Syria and northern Iraq, has joined them too, and is allied with the descendants of Lot, which are nomadic tribes in Iraq, Jordan, and Iran, who descended from Moab and Ammon. Now let me make something clear. When the United States removes her troops at the end of this year from, I from Iraq, Iran will take over. It's part of uh, scripture being fulfilled prophetically. We won't be able to stop it. We won't be able to negotiate it. We won't be able to politicize it. It's going to happen and it's only because the Almighty is orchestrating end times events to lead us to the rapture and the return of Messiah. The Arab League includes Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Jordan, Yemen, Sudan, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, Kuwait, Algeria, Bahrain, Qatar, Oman, and the United Arab Emirates. The most recent additions to the Arab League are Mauritania, Somalia, Palestine, Djibouti, and Comoros to list to the list of the Islamic states added to its roster. Forgive me for misreading or misstating the names. I speak English, I, I read Greek, but anything else I tend to trip over. So a little self-deprecation doesn't hurt. The list of nations mentioned in Psalm 83 have never before in history been a joint alliance with Russia against Israel and have never had a unified front for such a venture until these last days. Make no mistake, Russia is backing Iran, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, and all of the other Arab states to provide them with the armament necessary to move against Israel and try to destroy her. It's happening. Those of you who are in the political realm denying this, take another look at what's really happening out in the world and then put it against scripture and you'll see it's happening. We can't stop it and I don't want to. I want to watch the Almighty stand there and provide the power necessary and the protection so that his name will be glorified among the universe. And that will happen at this point. Iran's president Ahmadinejad calls Israel a dirty microbe and a savage animal that will soon be, disappear in a flash. Hint, they're going to try to use nuclear armaments to destroy her. 
Hezbollah has declared that Israel will disappear in a flash after its next war with her. That's not going to, be, going to happen. Hezbollah will be completely destroyed. Ma, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the leader of Iran, has prom promised to remove Israel off the face of the map and re erase her name out of the history books by destroying all Jews throughout the world. Sound familiar? Look back at Psalm 83. Asaph prayed that Israel's enemies, the Arab League and Russia, will be decimated, their armies scattered, their countries destroyed, and their leaders executed according to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Psalm 83, 16 through 18 says, Cover their faces with shame, so that men will seek your name, O, o Yahweh. May they ever be ashamed, which is another way of saying confused, and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that you, whose name is Yahweh, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. Let me tell you, that will happen. When those nations move against Israel, the Almighty is going to take quick and decisive action. That's why that's going to, that area is going to be called the Valley of Decision. And all nations who have moved against her will be brought to repentance because they're going to mourn over the death of their peoples and armies. I'm going on to point three. The first Gog-Magog war is yet to happen. Iran is developing nuclear arms from Russia for her allies in the Arab League to destroy Israel. Historically, the Gog-Magog wars of Ezekiel 38 and 39 have not happened yet. There have been minor fulfillments over the centuries, but nothing like what's coming. The first Gog-Magog war will happen prior to the rapture in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, also known as the Valley of Decision. That, the second one, like I mentioned earlier, will be held on the plains of Megiddo, called the Armageddon War, or Harmageddon. Joel 3 tells us the first Gog-Magog War will take place in the Valley of Decision, or Judgment, which is the Valley of Jehoshaphat, before the building of the New Temple in Jerusalem. Make no mistake, either before or after the rapture, the New Temple will be built. And that's where the new treaty, the, the false peace treaty for the seven years, will take place by the hand of the false Messiah. Joel 3, 9 through 11 tells us, Say to the nations far and wide, get ready for war. Call out your best warriors. Let all your fighting men advance for the attack. Hammer your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Train even your weaklings to be warriors. Come quickly, all you nations everywhere, gather together in the valley of Jehoshaphat. After Messiah's congregation is removed in Revelation 4, Revelation 9 prophesies the first Gog-Magog war will have been a past action and not, a future, not part of the future prophetic events yet to take place. Here's what um, Revelation 9:12 prophesies. The first terror is past, but look, Two more terrors are coming. That's a minor and, a, and, a, uh, and an ultimate fulfillment. It has several different applications. In this one, it's referring to the first of the Gog-Magog Wars. The invasion of Israel takes place after its inhabitants have been brought forth out of the nations. That took place after World War II. They were brought in from all four corners of the earth to establish Israel. And they are now dwelling safely. They're firmly established. Um, they, in Jerusalem, have just recently taken a poll, and they feel more um, protected there than anywhere else in the world, even though they have all these things going on around them. And they will inhabit the desolate places on, of the mountains of Israel. Israel was a desolate, um, barren wasteland until the Jews started moving in. Once land is being established by humanity, it starts producing. And they are producing things that are making the countries actually envy their prosperity and their technology. Ezekiel 38, 10 through 12 prophesies, At that time, evil thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise a wicked scheme. You will say, Israel is an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages. I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. I will go to those formerly desolate cities that are now filled with people who have returned from exile in many nations. I will capture vast amounts of plunder. 
for the people are rich with livestock and other possessions now. They think the whole world revolves around them. Guess what? It does. All prophecy <laughs> revolves around Israel. All um, things that happen in the Middle East revolves around Israel. Israel is the key timepiece in Elohim's um, world of prophetic events and his timepiece in history. Oh, make, mark my words. Israel is the center of the world and everything revolves around her. And we are going to watch it happen. Ever since the Zionist uh, immigration of the 1820s through the Second World War, Jews have returned to their land in great numbers, resulting in the sovereign, of na the sovereign nation of Israel being born on May 14, 1948, and accepted into the international community on May 15, starting with the United States and uh, England, the United Kingdom, and the rest of Europe and the Eastern Bloc countries. Because Israel is now experiencing unparalleled prosperity and technological superiority, she is on the cusps of this type of envy from Russia and her surrounding Arab neighbors. Along with this influx of Jews from around the world, the Israeli economy has mushroomed to such an extent that it is considered to be an economic and technological powerhouse. Russia is focusing her envious eyes on Israel and her natural and technological resources. Never in history has either nation uh, experienced times like this until the fulfillment of the last day's prophecies, which Elohim is orchestrating even to this day. When the Russian coalition attacks Israel, along with the Arab League of Nations, it will usher in the prophetic event that proves Israel is under Yahweh's protection. Five-sixths of that coalition of armies and countries will be decimated by him and his warrior angels. Make no mistake, it's going to happen. Ezekiel 38, 19 and 21 and 22 warns, When Gog invades the land of Israel, my fury will boil over. In my jealousy and blazing anger, I promise a mighty shaking of the land of Israel on that day. I will summon the sword against you on the hills of Israel, says Adonai Yahweh. Your, young, young, your men will turn their swords against each other. I will punish you and your enemies with disease and bloodshed. I will send torrential stain, or rain, hailstones, fire, and burning sulfur. Can anyone say nuclear attack? That's the same thing that happened to the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are the same effects of a nuclear blast. They are going to try to send their missiles, their nuclear missiles against Israel, and the angels are going to send them back from where they came. You can be sure of this, it's going to be a bloodbath. And we're going to sit here and watch it and praise the Almighty because he is fulfilling scripture and prophet, prophecy. And it will be very strongly um, understood, finally, that he's in control of everything. In conclusion, constant conflicts, wars, and fighting plague Israel constantly. The truth is the Middle East and Israel will never be, have true peace until Messiah returns and sets his universe in order. Amen. Yeshua, come quickly. Maranatha, Lord Jesus. The League of Arab States couldn't have come into existence prophetically until Israel became a nation. The League of Arab States has never existed at any time in his, Israel's history in this form until the last hundred years. This confederation against Israel is a unified body of states that believe that Allah is the true God. It is in a failed belief that they will resist and rebel against the one true Almighty and King of the universe. Every nation that joins the coalition that attacks Israel will be judged by the Almighty's hammer of justice. 86% of the people, militaries, countries, and religions involved will be destroyed for their efforts. Israel is the physical evidence that Elohim's word is true, that he is the one true almighty one, invincible and omnipotent, who will protect Israel when these alliances move against her. In benediction, I would like to read 2 Peter 1, 19-21. We have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets, you must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and Messiah, the morning star, shines in your hearts. 
Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding, from the, nor from human initiative. No, these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from Elohim. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that prophecy is starting to uh, be fulfilled exponentially in these last days, that we are here to watch it and experience it and wait for your return so that we can go home with you. We thank you for your word, which gives us the light to our path and the lamp to our feet that guides us during these dark hours of troublesome times. We give ourselves over to you, to your love and to your grace. We pray these things and trust in these things in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.